Hello and welcome to the Internet of Things Made Simple. I'm Larry Bohemer. This is episode number 12, and I thank you for listening. Shout out to our new listeners. There's been a ton in January, a bunch more already in February. Welcome aboard. Check out our webpage, the Internet of Things Made Simple.com, and I kindly ask you to subscribe to this podcast using your favorite podcast service. In our main topic, we're going to cover how IoT and big data are helping to give professional athletes and weekend warriors like me a competitive edge by providing an incredible wealth of data. But to start, we're going to look at robots again. Yes, robots again. And why I think robots equal smart and motivated and humans equal dumb and lazy. A lot of talk about automation is to amplify every possible excuse that a robot could have and why we should not use one. They're cold, they don't express emotion, power could fail, they could be hacked, you name it. Doing this hurts us in two ways. It downplays the capability of robots while ignoring the fact that humans really have a lot of flaws. In order to accurately compare, we need to look at the strengths and weaknesses of both equally and judge them fairly. When you do, you will see that humans don't really fare that well in many cases. In fact, one can easily argue, as I'm about to, that robots are smart and motivated, and humans are dumb and lazy. Here's why. Robots are inherently unbiased, and they don't factor emotions into decisions. They look at data and previous outcomes, and then they make their decision. If they do have bias, which we're going to talk about in an upcoming podcast, the bias was put in by a human. They treat all humans the same. They don't care how old you are, what race you are, what gender you are, what your religious beliefs are. Not so for humans. Just look at pretty much every war in the last thousand years. Take a situation like a parole hearing or a jury or even being evaluated at a hospital. It's really easy to argue that a robot would be superior as they wouldn't factor in any prejudice into a decision. Also, humans can only base decisions on a set number of factors. So there's only so many cases and books you can read. Robots can make decisions on billions of factors in seconds. So imagine you're getting a diagnosis for a rare disease, one that only affects a few people in each province or state. A robot could read through every file ever created about that disease and put together a much better diagnosis than the average doctor. I'm not saying we should get rid of doctors, but If you're asking which one can better diagnose, I'm putting my bet on the robot. In the next part, I want to walk through a scenario for you. You're tired. You're driving home. You didn't sleep well that night. Maybe you were binge watching a show or whatever. And you're so tired you have to keep the window open just to stay awake. You're that tired. Along the same lines, a bit of a different scenario. You have kids just yelling in the back of the car. So much though that you're yelling at them and Ugh, kid, stop it. And then the final scenario is, you just got chewed out by your boss. They yelled at you in front of everyone. You're leaving there, clenching your fist, going, ugh, I gotta quit, I hate this stupid job, ugh, and you're thinking about it the whole way home. In any of those three scenarios, are you at your best? I doubt it. You're probably just barely surviving the drive home. You know who doesn't have any of those issues? Autonomous cars. Their brain always functions at the top level. Plus, they don't do drugs, they don't drink, and they don't speed to get home and watch the ball game. Finally, I want to talk about something I've noticed. If you were to watch an experienced waitress work, it's something to behold. They seem to have the ability of five people to juggle things. They're looking after eight tables, they're getting bills ready, it's amazing. The same goes for a busy nurse, even a cashier, and a preschool teacher. They seem to have this incredible ability. Now, take that person to the mall on their day off, and if they're like most people, they won't be anywhere near as sharp. My theory, and it just is my theory, is that everyone loses a few IQ points, more for some people, when they're not working. So, you know, again, who doesn't have that concern? Robots. They're always functioning properly. Now, can a robot do everything? Of course not. But more and more, they're absorbing data, improving their communication skills, and the processing speed is incredible, and that allows them to better interact with humans. It's not going to take long before they're better than us at almost everything, and that does scare the heck out of me. So in a future podcast, we're going to cover how governments need to, and are, 
finding ways to regulate robots how they learn, such as does a robot have to take a driving test? So when we come back from the break, we're going to go over how IoT has the power to change sport and recreation. Back in a few seconds. Okay, welcome back. We're going to be covering a few different things, and I'm going to list them off here. That way you can decide uh, which part you want to tune into, I guess. The first is the general gains that IoT brings for athletes of all levels and in all sports. And that's namely how it helps you with things like fatigue and training, which we'll go into. We're going to talk about how it helps the four major North American sports, being football, baseball, basketball, and hockey. I can't believe I almost forgot hockey. If I did, I'd have to give up my Canadian passport. We're going to cover how it helps a few popular sports, namely golf, the triathlon sports of running, biking, and cycling, all racket sports, rock climbing and skydiving, fishing and hunting, even bird watching, and I'm going to argue it is a bit of a sport, and animal-based sports. We're also going to talk about how it helps protect your valuable sports equipment, how it helps your experience at the gym, and how it helps you as a fan, like in the upcoming Super Bowl. First is the general gains that it brings athletes. And it doesn't matter what sport you do. One of the biggest factors in determining the success in sports is fatigue. A fatigued athlete does not perform at their best. I don't care if you're a high-end athlete or a weekend warrior. When you get tired, you don't do that well. However, fatigue is not all the same. I kind of look at it in three different ways. There's fatigue that happens as the event progresses. So, you know, halfway through a marathon, halfway through your squash game, you know, the 10th hole, whatever it might be. Although you shouldn't be that tired of a 10th hole. Golf's not that hard of a sport. That's a bit of a shot at my business partner in case he's listening. There's also the fatigue that comes from overtraining, something that golfers don't know anything about, but other athletes do, and also by not allowing enough time to rest. Finally, there's fatigue that comes from illness, and that's something that affects all athletes. So while you're playing, biometrics are used to determine how you're doing. And that's looking at your heart rate. It's looking at your amount of sweat you're going on. You're changing in breathing patterns. It can also help to determine a sign of weakness. So if you get to the third quarter of your basketball game and your heart rate constantly is going up, it's a good sign that perhaps you had to spend more time in the gym. The same goes for if certain areas of the sport are tiring you out more, that gives you something to work on. However, your monitoring should take place before you even get to your event. Off-field monitoring helps to monitor for things that may indicate overtraining or illness, except in the case of golf. Smart blood pressure cuffs are used to show what your resting heart rate and your blood pressure are, and they're very helpful in the morning, especially before you put your feet down and go to get up. If you take them every morning, you set a bit of a baseline, and that way you know my blood pressure is this, my heart rate is that. If it's higher than it should be, that could be a sign of one of two things. If you had a heck of a workout the day before, and you've just been killing yourself, it's probably your body telling you, yeah, you know, I'm taking too much effort to recover you may want to slow up a little bit. But it could also be that an illness is coming on, and that might tell you, you know what, maybe I shouldn't work out so hard this day. Again, unless you're in golf, then do whatever you want. We're going to move on now to the big money sports, at least in North America, the four major sports. Again, it's hockey, which I'll put first this time, baseball, basketball, football. So we're going to start actually with baseball, which is a sport that's near and dear to my heart. It's not like baseball is against using data or numbers. In fact, they made a whole freaking movie about it. You know, Moneyball, you might remember, is all about data. The idea of Moneyball was a lot of teams were looking for athletes based on common stats, and Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill had found a way to evaluate athletes that found different traits that people weren't overpaying for. So baseball has an advantage over the other sports in that all the players start in a relatively fixed position. Yeah, I know there's shifts going on that messes things up a little bit, but for the most part, the fielders are all roughly in the same place and the pitcher or the defense starts with the ball in their hands. So it makes it much easier to categorize data. They're taking data though from some new sources and the first is smart bats and that's how fast the bat speed flings through the zone. So it's measured in miles per hour and the faster the bat speed, the more likely you are to have longer contact. And the other part about contact is the angle. So you can have all the bat speed you want, but if every ball is going straight up in the air and pop flying, that's not good. If everything's going straight down into the ground, it's way more likely to result in an out. They're looking for a certain launch angle, and IoT is helping with that. The next part is more for the pitchers, and that's sensors that are placed in balls, 
and that helps to track the movement and speed a little differently than radar guns. It's also used as a side note for some kind of a collectible ball. So say someone's coming up to hit the big home run record, they'll use a special marking on it, and that way they can scan it for authenticity purposes. Finally, fielders are still involved in the world of IoT, and that's by using high-speed cameras. They're used to judge a player's reaction time, their positioning, how fast they react to certain things, and allows them to work on training that. The next sport is basketball, and basketball always seems like a simple game, and it kind of is, until you start to learn more about it, and that's when I became fascinated by basketball. It's just the strategy is much more in-depth than you know once you get to know the game a little bit. Like baseball, NBA teams are using cameras to detect reaction time and positioning. Unlike baseball, there's a transfer of possession that happens very often in basketball, and you want to make sure the player is reacting quite quickly to that. These cameras will see where they're looking in the right place, how fast do they react, how fast do they move, and it gives you something to work on. The other part is, basketball is a very physical sport. People do get tired. In addition to using biometrics, they're also using facial gestures. So perhaps you have a certain face that you make whenever you're really tired that will be picked up by the camera and that way they know what to focus on. The last two sports I'm going to lump together are hockey and football. And it's not because they're the same, they're quite different, but I put them together mainly because of how the game has changed. They were always considered to be contact sports. So you contact each other and that was part of the legal action. With the size of the players and the speed they're moving at, It's not a contact sport anymore. It's become a collision sport. And that's made the sport way more dangerous. Sensors are being used to help to detect what the level of danger is. So if a big hit were to happen, whether it's on the pads or particularly on the helmet, it can register the impact. And what that will do is it'll allow them to see if you're likely into a concussion state and not have to rely on the player to say, yeah, I'm not feeling too well. The other part about sensors is that it's not always the big hits. It's often the tally of little hits. If you saw the movie Concussion, they focused on uh, Mike Webster. Mike Webster probably didn't have as many big collisions as some of the running backs did. However, as an offensive lineman, he got hit many collisions, I call them. Probably still a big impact, but smaller, 30, 50, 80 times a game for 16 games a year for over a dozen years. And that's what gave him CTE. It wasn't that one-time big collision the same way it might be with a hockey forward that gets hit by a defenseman. So these sensors are also measuring the cumulative hits that the players take. In hockey, they're starting to use sensors on the skates. And I'll talk a little bit later about Foxtrack, which was the first attempt to use sensors in hockey. And it's good and bad, and we'll go over that. But now they're putting them onto skates, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is to measure the velocity of how fast the player is skating. And also can show historical trends. So if a guy's skating at a certain speed in the first period and now he's slower, that could be a sign of fatigue. It's also a way to measure how much a player skates and that we can tell how active they are. Finally, with football, there's two kinds of concerns when it comes to temperature. And it seems to be all extremes. You have the ridiculously cold places like Green Bay where the players are worried about becoming an icicle while playing in December. But the one I'm going to talk about is the exact opposite. And that's playing in Texas in September, for instance, when overheating or excessive heat is a problem. Sensors are being used to monitor the heat on the turf. And why I say turf is that grass will absorb some of the heat that comes from and some of the energy that comes from the sun. Turf tends to reflect it. So it might be a certain temperature outside, factor in the temperature in the sun, and now factor in the extra heat being bounced off by the turf. That's really hot. So unfortunately, some players who didn't want to tell people they were overheating have passed away. And that's something we can never have again. So these sensors are telling what the actual temperature is on the turf, which can help people take actions accordingly. The next sport, which I'll stop making fun of, is golf. And few players are nearly as crazy about technology as golfers. They will buy any technology. And I've always said that having a golfer as a friend or a spouse is a good thing because you never run out of crap to buy them. And they're going to use all of it, by the way, which is great. We're going to talk about a few different ways using technology, but specifically IoT. The first is on the golfer themselves. There is no shortage of smart devices, bands, sensors, this, that, that you wear on the body. And that helps to keep track of things like positioning, the movement of the player, uh, what kind of angle they approach, you name it. 
All that information is sent back via Bluetooth to a smartphone app and can also be sent to the coach who can put it up on the screen and show you how bad your swing is, in my case. The next area is shoes. When you think smart shoes, you might think like I did, which is running and sports like that, but they're definitely making their way into golf. They help to keep track of things like steps walk, which is important. We all got to keep active. But more importantly, they're checking on exertion level. So when they're making that swing, are you putting too much pressure on the outside of your left foot, for instance? And that's the reason why you're slicing. It could also be to prevent injury from happening. The third area is smartwatches. And yeah, they're everywhere. I did a full podcast on health and I covered smartwatches to death. So I'm just going to cover the golf part here. The first thing they do is to keep track of score because apparently adding up to five, or in my case, 15 on a golf hole is too much work for people. The second thing they're doing is GPS. So you can imagine you're on the fairway, you're 150 yards and your approach shot. It will tell you exactly how far you are from the hole. And it does that using GPS technology. It knows where you are. And I think it's 30,000 golf courses on Garmin are mapped out and that will allow you to do that. In my case, it doesn't matter at all. I might as well take the putter out in the middle of the fairway and give a whale on it, but that's just me. The last part, similar to how sensors are worn on the body, they are worn on the clubs as well. And that does the same thing. It shows you the motion of the club, very similar to baseball with bat speed. It shows you club speed. So I guess that's about the same thing. So it will give you more information. IoT is always about information. Whether or not you can do much with it is up to you, but it's all about information. When we come back, we're going to cover a few more sports, including the triathlon sports, racket sports, and things like skydiving. Back in five seconds. Okay, welcome back. The first one I'm going to talk about is triathlon sports, which is running, cycling, and swimming. First, stop calling it jogging. I'm not going for a jog. I'm not some 70s dude with a big cotton headband and a sweatshirt on. And you know, those Adidas sneakers going for a run around the block. I'm going for a serious activity here. So please call it running. I'm going for a run, not a jog. I put these all together because many people who do one of them, they do more than one of them, whether they compete in a full triathlon or whether they just do for fun. They also tend to be equally obsessive among the three sports. So they kind of fit in pretty well together. If you do decide to do all three of them and do a triathlon, First of all, God bless you. I can't imagine doing an Ironman in some of these events, but imagine you do decide to do this. There are specific watches that will measure things like your run and your biking, but it will also measure your transition time using GPS and that helps you get faster at that. Very similar to other smartwatches, they use body-worn analytics. Usually in the case of straps, these people aren't usually heavily into wrist-worn. I do use one. But if you're more serious into these three events, you're probably going to wear a chest strap. And that gives you information about how you're breathing and your heart rate and uh, things like that. It also allows you to link to the bike. A lot of times they use onboard diagnostic on the bike. It can measure different things and that will feed back to your watch as well. In terms of specific equipment, I talked about smart shoes in the section on golf. It makes a lot more sense in running when you actually put some effort into the sport. So what the shoes will do is a couple things. They're going to measure the impact. So if you're coming down too hard, if you're lifting up too high, they're going to measure those things, which will factor into your running gait. They're also going to measure your cadence, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And they're going to let you know that, hey, you've run a little bit too much on these things. Very similar to the automatic oil change for your car. They're going to tell you it's now time to change your shoes. I'm not sure if they're going to do that when it's best for them or when it's best for you, but they're going to do that anyways. And you can thank Under Armour because they're the first person I saw to put these smart shoes out. Shoes are not the only thing that are smart. If you go into any kind of a good running store or a running pavilion at a marathon, there is no shortage of things. It rivals golf, you know, smart socks that can measure your sweat, smart hats that can measure your perspiration level, smart headphones that can measure your heart rate, wristbands, you name it. And I'm sure they're going to come out with more things soon enough because I guess runners are about as obsessive as golfers. One of the things they're showing you is running gait. And that's how your alignment is. You know, are you pronating? Are you supinating? Are you doing different alignment problems? And that helps to prevent injury. It also shows you your cadence. And why that matters is you're going to want to have the same cadence or how many steps per minute you take, roughly the same amount each time. So if you're running a little faster, you just make your stride a bit longer. If you keep your cadence in the same ballpark, 
it makes for a much easier way to run. The other thing I mentioned was the lift. There's no gain in going vertical or going up and running. Everything is going forward. So the more you go up, it's just wasted energy. So you can work on ways to keep yourself lower to the ground, and that helps you be more efficient. In terms of cycling, there are smart helmets. And I do want to talk about a commercial that was on a little while ago from Cisco. It was the coolest commercial. The guy is riding along on his bike. He takes a header, whacks his head off the ground. Next thing you know, this smart helmet sends an alert out to everyone, including Santa Claus. And his doctor knows about it. The hospital knows about it. The ambulance come pick some, comes and picks him up. It's all great, except for it's all BS. None of that can really happen right now. It's just a cool idea that Cisco wishes will happen, and maybe they will make it happen, but it's not here now. Smart helmets now, they do a little bit of that. They might monitor for impact. Some of them are able to send an alert using Bluetooth to your phone, which can call one of your preset people, so call your spouse or your friend. They're also able to monitor for things like hairline cracks, So maybe you have a bad habit of bouncing your hat off the ground when you come back into the garage. It will monitor how many impacts the hat has had and will tell you that, you know what, there's a bit of hairline cracks inside. It's now time to change it. So I can see that for smart, but definitely a flag on the play for Cisco. It's nowhere near what they're talking about. In terms of safety, there's a few things that are happening. As a male runner, I have to admit I don't really think about safety as much as some, unfortunately, some of the females have to. We don't have the issue with a certain kind of predator, dudes. At least they don't come after me anyways. Maybe I'm too old for them now. I'm not sure. But in terms of panic alarms, that's something that I haven't had to worry about. And I guess I have the fortune of being male there because a lot of female runners I've spoken to, they just have that issue of, you know, potential predators. And that's sad, but it's reality. So a lot of female runners will carry panic alarms. And that allows them to push the alarm and it sends an alert through their phone and it can tell people where they are. The other kind of predator does affect males equally, and that's animals. If you're running in downtown Manhattan, the chance of a bear coming anywhere near you is not very high. It would be a cool story if it did, but not really high. If you're running in a forest area somewhere in the mountains, there's a good chance you're going to come across not only a bear, but a cougar and other animals. So again, having that panic alarm definitely helps. The other part is a lot of athletes, so say competitive mountain bikers, guys who do a lot of running in the mountains, as well as open water swimmers, can often be in places where there's no cell coverage. There's only GPS coverage and maybe satellite. And they'll carry these little beacons that they can hit a button and it will alert search and rescue, come get them. So that's definitely helpful. There are more things, I'm sure, but that's enough talk about the triathlon sports for now. The next sports section we're going to talk about is racket sports, and that includes everything from tennis to badminton to squash to racquetball. They're all kind of in the same boat, and a lot of this does overlap with golf, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. But tennis players are quite obsessive that I've seen. Very similar to golf, they often have on-person sensors, and again, same idea. It's going to monitor, is your swing open? Are you moving your arm the way you should? Are you swinging too hard? It's going to monitor all those things, send it back via Bluetooth to a smartphone app, and allow you and your coach to see what's going on. Also similar to golf, the rackets are getting smarter. Same idea, it can monitor your swing, won't go through it again. The one part that is a bit different though, I did mention in golf that there's GPS that helps you with your shot to know how far you are, but that's the watch. That's not the course. They're not doing anything to the course in that case. In tennis, and I'm sure in other racket sports the same, They are doing that. If you've ever seen a pro tennis match live, you get to understand how fast 120 mile an hour serve is. I don't know how those officials see. To me, it's just blink and then the ball's gone. So how do they know if it's in or out? What they've started to do is to use smart courts, and that will allow them to measure the in and out much faster and much more accurately. You may have seen during the US Open the last few years, IBM sponsors this little tool that will show in or out. That's only for challenges. You're now eventually going to see it for every shot, I'm sure. The next two sports are combined together, even though they're not really related. And that's mainly for the reason of, I would never do either of these things without a gun pointed in my head or being told the plane's going down. And that's rock climbing and skydiving. However, I don't want to call the people that do these crazy because they're definitely not crazy. I know people that do both. They're very intelligent people. They're very passionate about it. So they've I've come to realize their sport is all about information, and information is key, 
not just to performance, but in this case, life or death. So IoT has been used in many forms to help both these sports for a long time. Both of them will use things like heart rate and altitude monitoring in their suits, and that uses GPS combined with biometrics, and that helps to know what's going on and to provide information. So do I open my chute in the case of skydiving? Do I have to change gloves, for instance, in the case of rock climbing? Very similar to what I mentioned with the sports that are taking place in the mountain area, GPS and satellite have been used for distress alerts a lot for these sports. And finally, they often use a lot of wind and temperature gauges. I think you can understand why. Wind's kind of important. You know, when you're skydiving, you kind of want to land where you're supposed to, so it's important to know the wind. And the temperature obviously makes sense for the rock climbers because they're going to want to know, do I put on extra layers? Do I change the rope? Whatever you have to do when the temperature changes. So on the next sports, which I'm combining into two, I first must apologize to golfers and other sports. I always thought golf was kind of the bar to set for obsessiveness until I sat down one day with a fisherman. And then I realized, yeah, golfers really aren't that obsessed. They get blown away by fishermen. And the same goes for hunters as well. People might say, well, why are you calling them athletes? Well, because I do consider it to be athletic in many cases. You know, I've seen these guys fishing with the waders on really cold water. I've seen people pull on marlins. That's not easy to do. That does take some athletic skill. Sure, sitting on a dock and flinging it with a beer in your hand might not, but I'm going to call them athletes. And the same goes for hunting. Some of these guys climb in trees. They get all into it. That can be athletic to me. They use smart stuff all over the place. Smart calls are used. They can be remotely activated or they can be used in other ways. Smart lures are used by fishermen. Those fishing radars that tell you where all the pools of fish are, they're all based on sensors and sonar. They also use motion-activated cameras and calls. You name it. So again, apologize to golfers. These guys are way more obsessive than you are. Okay, bird watching might not seem like a sport, but it's very popular. I do run in nearby Fish Creek Park, and I swear every bird that's ever flown on the earth is there on a Saturday in the summertime, and as well as every person that's ever watched a bird is also there. So I'm going to call it a sport because it's so popular. Sensors are being used to track motion, so they're putting them in certain areas. If they know this one bird they want to see will fly to this one spot on a tree, they're putting sensors there. The same goes for temperature and other variables. If certain birds or species are more likely to be in an area when it's a certain temperature, they want to know that, and that helps them to find the birds they want to find. They're also starting to experiment with color detection, which I found kind of cool. This can be in glasses or it can be in the camera. And so say this one rare bird has this cool shade of red. They're able to put in that cool shade of red into the camera, and whenever it's picked up, it's alerted to them by text message. And that way they can know, get the heck over to the park, this rare bird is there. The last part is not so much to do with IoT, and it came from one of my running buddies, Miles, is that they're using a lot of databases and cloud-based services to be able to put in clubs and everything else so that people can see, yes, this bird was spotted yesterday, and people can put in comments, that kind of stuff. The last one we're going to talk about before the break might involve birds, and that's animal events. You name it, it could be anything from dog shows to horse jumping, horse racing, dog sled racing, probably 20 other ones as well. Working with animals brings a few challenges. They may understand a few commands, and I'm sure people that are drunk sometimes have had full conversations with animals, but they don't really talk to us, and that means they can't tell us much about their health. Sure, you might see it limp, the animal, but it's not going to tell you too much otherwise. So that's where biometrics help, to monitor for fatigue and for injury. The next one is, since animals can't drive, unless there's some really funny video on YouTube that I haven't seen, so let me know. They shouldn't be that far from their cages at night. Uh, GPS tracking is used to detect if they've left. And if you allow them to move a certain distance away from their cage, you can use a geofence that says they're allowed to go 50 yards. But beyond that, let me know. It can also let you know that they're traveling at a speed that's beyond their capability. If your dog runs at 15 miles an hour and all of a sudden they're going 80 miles an hour down the highway, you can know that they're on board a car and your valuable dog has been stolen. The last thing it helps out with is automatic feeding, and that helps you keep track of what they ate. Sure, you could just measure it out, but if you use biometrics in the course of a day to see how much they exercised and see how much sleep they had, these programs can better detect should they get extra food that day. It can also detect if their temperature is up, so maybe they're not feeling well, so give them some extra food to help them feel better. 
When we come back from a short break, we're going to answer a couple of questions. The first is, what the heck? Where is my sport? We're also going to cover how IoT is helping your equipment keep it in better shape and how it's helping the fan experience. Back in a few seconds. Okay, so welcome back. First, I just realized I'm going to be way over 30 minutes with this. So hopefully you're finding it entertaining enough to be able to listen to more than 30 minutes of me yapping away. So to answer the first question, what the heck, where is my sport? Well, there's hundreds of sports out there. I can't cover them all. I'd like to, but can you imagine me just yammering on? Next is archery. It would just be kind of boring. So I didn't want to do that. So what I decided to do was talk about the general things in the beginning. And that's why I talked about heart rate and biometrics and fatigue. So any sport that has any kind of aerobic or anaerobic base to it is going to benefit from you having a better heart. And that can be monitored by heart rate and by blood pressure. But other sports are kind of the exact opposite. Sure, it's good to have a good heart for activities in general, but you might want to be able to lower your heart rate. So take that archery person, which I will talk about archery after all, I guess, or sports shooting. When you get nervous, your heart rate goes up. They want to work on bringing it down for better concentration and accuracy. Biometrics does the same thing. It can let you know that you're not doing well enough. You have to work more on your relaxation, whatever it might be. As well, athletes of all kinds, as well as soldiers and and minors and other people like that, are wearing smart shirts to be able to report back how they're doing. Equipment's expensive. I never really realized until I went to go look at treadmills, walk by Peloton, and realize my first two cars didn't cost that much. So, and maybe you don't have to spend $10,000 on a treadmill, but any equipment's expensive. You know, shoes, even basketballs. So you want to keep things working properly. The first thing IoT does is keep track of it. So if it's a high-end piece of equipment, you know, your $10,000 bike or your snowmobile, it's going to keep track of it using GPS. But you're not going to do that with your golf bag. I don't think so. What you might do instead is use those little tile things and you can just find it using Bluetooth. You can use them for your car keys as well. So that's definitely helpful. The other part is you can look at a basketball and realize, yeah, it's deflated. But how do you keep track of maintenance on bikes? How do you remember the last time you looped this or the last time you changed a chain on this or whatever it might be on your motorcycle? That's where IoT helps out. Very similar to those reminders you might get from your auto dealer. You can get those reminders to say, hey, it's time to change the oil on your bike. So IoT is making its way into gym equipment. I mentioned Pelotron, and they are really cool, by the way. You know, maybe maybe winning the lottery one day, I'll buy a Pelotron, but I don't want to spend $10,000 on a treadmill anyways. But they do allow you to interact with classes using the camera on board and a built-in touchscreen. And that, if it helps you work out more often, then maybe ten grand is a good investment. I don't know. The other part is, is that some programs, I've seen these on your iPad, you can put in front of you, They use the camera on board your device, and that will take a picture or an image of you running, and then it will impose that on the screen. So say you always wanted to run in Central Park, you can impose yourself, and it will give you a point of view as if you're running in Central Park. Not just that, they've got the Alps, Rome, other places as well, so they're pretty cool, and that's something that you don't spend $10,000 on. The other part is Apple's Gym Kit I wanted to talk about, and this allows you to sync your activities from the treadmill, for instance, or other bikes and other pieces of cardio equipment to your applications, whether that be your running app or things like MyFitnessPal. Not that you couldn't do it manually, but the fact that it does it automatically is a little better. The last thing I talk about is fan experience. You know, the Super Bowl coming up, everyone always says, you know, going to a game is the best. And it probably is to a certain extent. You get to appreciate the athletes and how they move and the size of them, the kind of skill and and the alignment. It's all great. But with HD now, and when you get some great announcers like Tony Romo and these guys, it's not as compelling to go to a game. So in both ways, to put your butts in the seat and to get you to watch at home, IoT is being used by sport clubs and by television networks to make it better and to give more information. I spoke about the Fox track, and those of you who aren't familiar with it, it was back in the 90s, I think it was, Fox was trying to get hockey pushed more in the US. One of the feedback they had was people couldn't find the puck, which I always found funny. It's a black disc on white ice. That's normally a pretty good contrast, but let's put that aside for a sec. What they did was they put sensors inside the puck, which was kind of cool, 20 years ago especially, and it created a bit of a glow. 
around the puck. I think it was yellow, if I remember right. I couldn't find a picture of it. And then so the puck would move around the ice. And when a guy would wind up for a shot, if it went over a certain velocity, that yellow would turn to this really cool Haley's Comet type trail. It was almost kind of cheesy. But you know what? Give credit where credit is due. At least they tried. Not everyone tries to sell the sport to a new audience. But more importantly, that launched IoT in sports. I truly believe that. So hats off to Fox. Despite the fact that it looked stupid back then, you guys started IoT, and that's great. IoT has also been used in another sport for a long time, and that's auto racing. What they do is go on board and get telematics or telemetry from the car. So they can tell you the RPMs, the speed, the G-force, all these different things. That's only getting better now with new technology. I mentioned how baseball was allowing coaches to see launch angle and speed, but it's also allowing the fans. So you can often see when a home run is hit, it will tell you how far the ball goes and it will tell you the launch speed and bat speed. I'm not sure that anyone but the real baseball nerds care about that, but those who care really do care. The last one is in football, and they've been using that updated first down line for a while. You can see, though, it's gotten a lot better. For a while, it would get blocked by players walking by. It was obviously almost kind of painted on. Now they must be using some kind of a sensor-based technology. It just looks cleaner, and it looks a little better. I think that things are only going to get better in IoT. One example is smarter footballs. I think very similar to the Fox track, they're going to do something with the football, And you're going to be able to see the spiral rate, the speed, the angle, all those kind of things. So not just the baseball nerds get to benefit, the football nerds get to benefit as well. The next one is they've had punch tracker and stuff in sports like UFC and boxing for a long time. I think they can really do a lot with that. You can get to see the bone crunching impact. You'll be able to see the speed and all these different things. I can only imagine where that sport's going. The last one has to do with sports like basketball, but it could be for high jump, I guess, during the Olympics. I think you're going to start to see more information about how high the guy jumped and the velocity. I think they're going to put more effort into that. And that's going to make like the slam dunk contest that much better. So the average fan will like these things, but you know who's going to love them? Gamblers. These guys are the best. They look for every possible little advantage. So think about that for a sec. If you know that Tom Brady throws at a certain velocity in the first quarter, and then all of a sudden in the third quarter, it's down a little bit, maybe you change your wage. They're coming out with a lot of those short-term wages. So who's going to get the next touchdown? How many points are going to be scored? If IoT gives information that they can get an edge on, you know Gambler is going to use this, only more so that gambling is now legal in the U.S. Sorry that I went over. Hopefully you found it entertaining, and hopefully you enjoyed it. I look forward to any feedback. If you did find it too long, let me know. As always, I ask you to check out some of our back episodes. Here's three I want to point out. Episode number one, which is our first one, which is our introduction, why IoT matters. Episode number five, what you need to know about 5G. And our first mini episode, which is still a surprise to me, by far our most popular episode. And that's how your IoT data can be used against you in a court of law. Thanks again for listening. I'm Letterable Humor. (laughs) 